Okay, 900 North sinking. We're trapped here. Help us! These were the last words said by USS Thresher Captain John Harvey. Before it implode in 1962, this moment became a very important part of history. It was the first time anyone had recorded an underwater implosion. But today, we're going to dive deeper into this tragic event and explore the incredible story behind it. We'll uncover the mystery of the USS Thresher, its brave crew, and the lessons learned from this disaster. So if you're ready to embark on this historical journey with us, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you won't miss what's coming up. SSN-593, more commonly known as USS Thresher, was a sight to behold. A nuclear-powered attack submarine comprising the latest technology and the finest engineering, she was a force to be reckoned with. Able to travel faster and further than a conventional sub, USS Thresher was only limited by the rations on board and the needs of the crew. Named after the Thresher Shark due to its characteristic shape and ability to seek out and destroy, the Navy's newest submarine could travel deeper and more quietly than any other underwater vessel, making it nigh on impossible to detect. Its revolutionary sonar system was the most comprehensive detection system ever devised for a submarine. USS Thresher had served the US Navy before, but in 1962 it was hauled out of the water and sat in Portsmouth Shipyard in New Hampshire. Darrett underwent an extensive overhaul. Panels were sealed, closed, piping connected, and dials and equipment trialed. She was lowered into the water, held fast by cables, and the propeller was tested. Behind its impenetrable steel exterior was a labyrinth of corridors and rooms. It could house more than 120 personnel comfortably for more than 30 days without resurfacing. The beds were stacked in threes, some folding down from the walls to save space. A small single locker was provided for each man to place his personal belongings in. The dining room was a place for the crew to relax. With built-in chessboards on the tables, the conditions were cramped, but better than previous models. The command the commanding officer was afforded only a tiny desk and telephone in his so-called study, but the technology installed in the control room was unrivaled at the time. A single man could operate the whole sub. With the push of a button, the submarine would maintain its depth and heading. On autopilot, it seemed USS Thresher was unbreakable indestructible, but the submarine was part of a deadly arms race. The need to ensure the defense of America and the West against a growing threat from the Soviet Union meant that corners were cut. The new technology installed was unfamiliar to many of the crew, improper training was provided to those on board. Some other concerns were raised regarding the electrical panels. They were not adequately protected from water. In the event of a flood, small imperfections were fatally overlooked in a rush to get her ready. In hindsight, the Navy's most prized underwater vessel was a disaster waiting to happen. The submarine's fateful voyage began hours before it launched from the dock. Just after 3 a.m., on April 1963, the vessel's engineers initiated the submarine's reactor and it was now a matter of hours before she would be fully powered and ready for her test voyage. Her primary task was to test her diving capabilities and the maximum depth she was designed for. The submarine would be supported by submarine rescue ship USS Skylark, who would maintain communications with Thresher during her deep sea dives under the command of 36-year-old Lieutenant Commander John Wesley Harvey. The USS Thresher and 129 crew set sail from Portsmouth ship yard and headed out into the open sea. As the submarine and Skylark rendezvous out at sea, John Harvey began the dive operations. They started with a shallow dive to test out the equipment. They checked the communication with Skylark via the underwater telephone was working and that all the crew were comfortable with their stations. Then the real test began. The crew were in safe hands. After graduating from the US Naval Academy, John Harvey served on an aircraft carrier and a diesel electric submarine. He underwent nuclear power training and worked as a reactor controls officer on board US Nuclear Submarine Nautilus. This became the first vessel to reach the North Pole, after which he became a bit of a celebrity, participating in the popular NBC TV show Concentration, winning $4,500 and making a name for himself. He progressed through his naval career as chief engineer, engineer, officer, and lieutenant commander on various submarines. By the time he was asked to command USS Thresher, he was incredibly experienced with Thresher's hull, built from HY-80 steel, a metal that is incredibly strong but relatively lightweight. It was designed to be able to dive to depths of up to 1,300 feet. When Harvey brought the submarine back to the surface after the initial test dive, he ordered Skylark to rendezvous with them. 200 miles east of Cape Cod, Thresher's crew plunged beneath the waves once more, each man dedicated to the task at hand. A mixture of experiences and ranks were on board, including 16 civilians. They were getting used to the conditions below the surface, to the camaraderie and the routine. The following day, on 10th April, at 6.35 a.m., USS Thresher resurfaced to periscope depth, 10 miles from where Skylark hovered. 
The two vessels communicated with each other, and Harvey was happy with the progress he and the crew had made so far. Although it was Skylark's responsibility to shadow the work of Thresher, there was very little it could have done if things went wrong. At Thresher's maximum depth, the ship had a rescue chamber that could sink to 850 feet, nowhere near the 1300 eft that Thresher was expected to operate at. Skylark's rescue chamber had only been used once before for a stricken submarine. At 235th, rescuing 33 men in 1939, Thresher began her ultimate dive to test depth, heading into the darkness beneath the waves. The submarine was no stranger to these kinds of descents and had successfully completed dives to 1300 40 times before her overhaul, but this time, something was different. Something was about to give. As the submarine descended, Harvey continued to communicate with Skylark. He announced that they had dived to 400 feft. Minutes later, he confirmed they had made it to half the test depth everything was going to plan. Communication was strong. The vessel was holding up. There was no sign of damage to the submarine's hull, something that was continuously checked by the crew. But danger was near. With every foot they descended, the pressure on the submarine grew. The weight bearing down on its steel exterior and still USS Threeshire continued downwards. During her stint in the shipyard, joints on the submarine had been sealed using silver brazing rather than the traditional welding method. This involved pouring a melted silver basid filler alloy to secure the joints. But under the enormous pressure of the ocean, one of these joints began to crack. Part of the saltwater piping system sprang a leak. One of the crew rushed to Harvey, who was in the control room. Harvey knew this was bad. He knew this could have catastrophic consequences. He immediately lifted the underwater telephone and called Skylark. He sent the message that they were experiencing a minor difficulty. The nature of the difficulty was not explained, and underneath the waves the crew were rushing to determine the source of the leak. Harvey made the decision to resurface. Whatever the cause for concern, they needed to ascend as quickly as possible. The seawater was spraying over the electrical boards, it was dangerously close to completely short-circuiting the system. As water saturated the electrical systems, the nuclear reactor began to shut down. Without it, they would have no means of power. Without it, they would sink further into the Atlantic abyss. By now, the difficulties they were experiencing were by no means minor. But Harvey was trying to convey a sense of calm to his crew members. He was trying to keep control of the situation, but it was a losing battle. He messaged Skylark again. They managed to control the sub. He relayed the information that they were now in a positive up angle. The nose of the submarine was lifting upwards. They were heading for the surface. Somehow they had managed to correct the downwards motion of the vessel, but the leaks grew progressively worse. Water was now entering at an alarming rate. Harvey checked the instruments again. On board the submarine, the lights began to flicker. The electricity was cutting out. The main steam stop valves were shut off, and the main coolant pumps stopped working. As the sub began to shut down, the steam couldn't be generated to propel it back towards the surface. Harvey and his crew began began plummeting through the darkness. He tried one last emergency procedure to save the lives of all 129 passengers. He attempted a blow-up. This procedure involves forcing high-pressure air into the ballast tanks, forcing out the water, lightening the load, and helping the submarine rise towards the surface. Skylark picked up the blow-up sound on its sonar at 09.13 a.m., but from the sound detected, they could tell that the procedure hadn't been successful. The increasing pressure on the submarine as it sank lower and lower in the water column was making it impossible for the water ballast to be expelled. Lieutenant Commander Stanley Hecker, the commanding officer on Skylark, asked Harvey to relay their course and bearing. There was no answer. He tried again each time pausing to hear a response, but none came. There was radio silence. A feeling of desperation filled Skylark's crew. Had they just heard their comrades' final moments? Was this the end? Again, Stanley Hecker asked Harvey for confirmation. Are you in control? He asked, repeating the question over and over. A deathly silence filled the air below the surface. The men were still fighting for their lives. At 9.17 a.m., Harvey was alarmed to discover that the sub had sunk to 900 feet below the test depth. He quickly radioed through to Skylark. His message was unclear. The line was breaking up. Skylark Stanley Hecker hovered over the phone, trying to make sense of the incoming message. He heard the words 900 north, referring to Thresher's 900 feet past their test depth of 1300 feet. This was an extreme extremely dangerous depth for the sub to be at. It was not made to withstand pressure at those depths. The minor difficulty that Harvey had initially been experiencing has been debated. If water had been leaking in through a peep just a few inches in diameter, then the seawater would have burst inwards at speeds of up to 1800. Those depths flooding would have been rapid. This would not have been described as minor. Furthermore, if water was rushing in, then surely Skylark would have heard the commotion and the rushing sound over the telephone. Communications would likely have been hampered. Some suspect the minor difficulty at 
that stage was a loss in power. Due to electrical failure, water was now likely pouring into the submarine. The force of the water would have sent crew members flying through the air as they were unexpectedly hit by the incoming jets. Everyone scrambled to try and plug the holes. The hole was creaking and groaning under the pressure. It would give way at any moment. There was the clattering and clinging sound of metal on metal. As the deep sea pressure began to pull the submarine apart, pipes burst. The interior insulating cork began to crack and flake away. Were these their final moments? Less than a minute after receiving Harvey's latest message, Skylark heard a hot stopping sound detected on the sonar. It was the sound of an implosion, the sound of the submarine's hull collapsing at 2,400 feet, followed by a bubble pulse. A shiver went up Lieutenant Commander Stanley Hecker's spine, and with his heart in his mouth, he tried to summon USS Thresher on the telephone. There was no response. Immediately, Skylark began dropping grenades. This was the predetermined signal that communications were lost, and that the submarine must resurface. It never did. Experts claimed that the implosion would have taken one twentieth of a second to complete, making it impossible for the crew to cognitively comprehend what was going on. They likely would have felt nothing as the 2,400 feet of water above them crushed everything under its weight. The wreckage of the indestructible USS Thresher and all 129 souls on board plummeted to the bottom of the Atlantic. When communication was lost, Skylark informed officers on land of the situation. A couple hours later, the families of USS Thresher's crew were notified. For those in the Navy and for the families involved, that was the end of it. Hearing the devastating news of lost loved ones was almost too much to bear. The only glimpse of peace they found from the shocking incident was that the crew would have lost their lives within milliseconds. There was no long drawn out suffering. They were gone as soon as the hall imploded. But for some search and rescue personnel sent to the location, their hopes didn't end there. In what has been described as a cover up by the US Navy, fresh insights into the immediate aftermath following Thresher's radio silence suggest there may be more to the story. Whilst several destroyers and additional ships from the Atlantic fleet powered towards the last known position of USS Thresher, Skylark remained on scene. There wasn't anything they could do. The damage was done. Or was it? If the submarine didn't catastrophically implode, then the leaks may have been plugged by the crew. Was there any hope of survival? Another submarine, USSC Wolf, moved towards the location, arriving on the morning of April 11th. Everyone was listening to their sonar and hydrophones, listening and waiting. Then Sea Wolf heard it, the distinctive ping from a nearby vessel, the potential ping of an underwater telephone. They spoke into their phone, calling on USS Thresher to send five dashes for a positive identification. Silence. The waiting was agonizing. Then there it was again. Another ping and another. Were they closing in on the missing sub? Had some of the crew miraculously survived? Maybe the submarine had somehow maintained neutral buoyancy and was neither able to travel up or down. Patiently, Seawolf waited. With each incoming ping, they tried to calculate a fix on the position, trying desperately to find a source of the sounds. Each member of the crew was anxiously optimistic that they had found their stricken comrades. A total of 37 pings came over the sonar. An eerie sound filled their control room. The crew pricked their ears. It sounded like whispers in the dark. Faint voices traveling along the ocean currents picked up by their underwater receivers. Could these be the ghostly voices of the Thresher crew? USSC Wolf once again asked for confirmation of identification. As they scoured the Atlantic waters off the continental shelf, the crew of USSC Wolf were plagued by sounds suggesting there was life beneath the waves. As the whispers faded, a less subtle sound began. Their sonar had picked up what sounded like the banging of metal on metal, the universal signal for help from a stricken underwater vessel. If electrics have failed, then hitting the hull of the submarine is often the only form of communication with the outside world. Anxiously trying to make contact with any survivors, USS Seawolf asks Thresher to bang five times to confirm its identification. The banging continued, but not by the exact number specified. Then all fell silent. The experiences of those reported on board Seawolf were kept out of the public domain by the US Navy. It was likely an attempt to avoid false hope for those who had lost their loved ones in the tragedy. Only recently have the documents been declassified and the reports picked apart. But there is credible evidence that USS Thresher imploded. Minutes after sending its final call to Skylark, the search area around Thresher's last known position was teeming with search and rescue crafts. The sounds that Seawolf had been picking up could have come from any one of them. From analyzing the audio received by Skylark and the depth recorded at the time, it was concluded 
concluded that the crew were deceased. The submarine likely imploded as it sank ever deeper due to electrical failure and ultimately loss of power. Despite the desperate hopes of the crew on board Seawolf, experts claim that it was impossible for Thresher to have maintained neutral buoyancy just above collapse depth. It was impossible for them to have transmitted those distress signals, and it was impossible for them to have gone undetected by all those search vessels homing in on the area. Over the following weeks, search ships scoured the ocean floor for any signs of USS Thresher. Using magnetometers, sonar, and Geiger counters, they detected some debris spread out over a significant area. Some debris floated to the surface and was recovered by search teams. The US then deployed its only bathascap, a deep seaman submersible, capable of reaching the ocean floor on which Thresher now rested. The submersible named Trieste 2 located the debris field spread out over a mile and retrieved some of the material for analysis. The employed hull of the submarine lay in pieces. Metal tubing was bent and distorted. The remnants of a once great asset to the US Navy now lay in bits 8,500 feet below the waves. From the tragedy of the USS Thresher's demise, classed as the worst submarine disaster in US history, came the birth of SubSafe, a submarine safety program focused on preventing flooding. During submersion, all work carried out and all materials used in the manufacture and repair of a submarine are tightly controlled. Every element in the building process is certified and traceable. Lessons about manufacturing faults were learned from Thresher's catastrophe. The silver braze joints were substandard. Vital equipment to stop flooding was inaccessible to the crew. Electrical components were exposed to salt water resulting in short circuits, a reactor shut down, and ultimately loss of power. And finally, the ballast tank blow system failed to operate correctly due to ice buildup in a restricted air system. These errors led to the 1960s disaster and they have now been rectified. Since then, only one US submarine has been lost and that was not certified until the Ocean Gate one. As countries continue to strive to protect their individual nations, errors in the weapon reused are likely to happen. Advances in weapons and defense may make our country stronger, but at what cost? Thanks for watching this story. Don't forget to like and subscribe and turn on your notification bell to stay updated on more similar videos. We would love to hear your thoughts, so feel free to share your comments below. Tell us what do you think of those signals heard over the radar. Until next time, stay safe and goodbye.